Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the next to the last day of uh, study of Genesis. So it worked out good to finish off the week. And uh, but today we're heading into chapter 50 and Jacob's funeral and procession back to Hebron. So let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, praise you and thank you so much for this day, for all the blessings you give on us all the time, Lord. Be with us and help us with our study with our Genesis chapter 50 and be with us and guide us as we uh, study your word. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. So. Let's get started. And uh, I'll be doing a little traveling. So I'll put up a map. I don't want this map or not. Let me see. Use this map. Uh, this has got all the places on it I think I want. Okay, going up a little bit. And so we're starting here, down here. Excuse me. Down here, Ramses. Uh, Ramses is a name for uh, 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 Goshen. Uh, you can see this whole area is called Goshen. This is the general area they believe he's at. They they were uh, they were at. Well, they could have been down at On, because On is where uh, uh, the Pharaoh would have been. So let's start reading here. Today we're going to try to do verses 1 through 14, which is a basic funeral. And then we'll get into uh, the uh, end of uh, chapter 50 tomorrow, where we talk about Joseph's uh, death and the uh, and basically his, uh, the end of the time that uh, the 12 tribes are in Israel prior to, uh, during this current generation. I should put it that way. As we get into Exodus, we'll start talking about them. The brief portion of chapter one of Exodus, it talks about the same thing, kind of. And then uh, we'll move into, uh, basically leap forward about 200 years and uh, talk about start talking about Moses. So that's the plan. Genesis 50, verse 1. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. Remember when we left off yesterday in chapter 49 that uh, uh, Jacob had died. Uh, he, after finishing the uh, prophecy to his sons, and uh, he gave up the ghost right there after he finished uh, telling the boys about their future. And here we see J uh, Joseph was the first one to, to uh, realize he passed away and uh, gave him one last good hug and a kiss. So Jacob really did love his dad. Uh, some say it's not uh, manly to cry. Well, I disagree. And I'm in a group of real men to include Jesus himself. He says here, well, he wept. Now let's look, look back at some men who cried in the Bible. Genesis 23, 2. And Sarah died in uh, Kerbetha, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Another man's man. About 2 Kings 13, 14. Here Elisha was falling sick of his sickness, whereof he died, and Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face, and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So the king of uh, Israel had actually uh, cried for his father, uh, Elisha. 
And of course, the most famous one is Jesus himself. Shortest verse in the uh, Bible, Jesus wept. This is the famous period of time when he came to uh, a small town near Jerusalem and Lazarus had died. And he arrived there. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead, but he could see the pain of his fellow Mary and uh, uh, the others there and how much it hurt him, hurt them to lose their brother. And so it hurt him also. It just shows Jesus had emotions just like the rest of us too. Even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Let's finish this passage. Uh, I think John 11, 35 through 38. I'm just going to read this portion. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused this, that even this man should not have died? And Jesus, therefore, again, groaning to him in himself, came, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Can you read in that chapter? He rose Lazarus from the bed, dead. Sometimes one of the reason he wept is because he knew Lazarus was actually in a better place. But he knew that uh, he had to fulfill this prophecy of raising Lazarus to death from the dead and that Lazarus was going to die again. Uh, this wasn't a uh, miraculous uh, resurrection like Jesus is going to have. <laughs> and one last one in Acts 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation. Lamentation is still another way of saying crying. So, but as a child of God, we only sleep and we'll be reunited with our brothers and sisters in Christ one day. So we, all, we have the promise of the... Uh, of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, that tells us that uh, uh, that we're only asleep, as Christians, we're only sleeping. Uh, we're not actually dead, spiritually. Our souls are waiting for us to, to, to meet again in heaven. Great passage here, one that we've heard a thousand times, but brings a lot of comfort. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. <clears throat> For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall dis descend with the, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Pray for comfort one another with these words. So that's our that's our hope and promise. And of course, it's Titus 2.13. Uh, let me grab it real quick. That's, that's a great verse too. Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us for all iniquity and pure and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort, and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. <laughs> but the best part of that is verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Okay, back to Genesis 50, verse 2. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, and the physicians embalmed Israel. Embalming, as we will see, also Joseph will receive the same treatment when we get to his portion in the second part of Genesis 50, verse 26. So Joseph, being, uh, Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. What I find of interest, though, is that we have found many mummies fully intact from that period, uh, prefer, perfectly preserved. And I wonder if the bodies of both Jacob, now in Hebron, uh, we'll see that. We'll get to verse 13, but here's a preview. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machaplia, with Abraham brought from the field for a possession of the burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Merami. And of course, that's all 
I'm going to get to that. It's up here. And Joseph, which we will see also, is carried to Hebron. Uh, we'll see that when we get in Exodus. Verse 13, verse 19. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you. You shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So are they just bones, or is it the whole body intact? Uh, kind of interesting. Uh, Full-fledged mummies. Maybe that's why the graves themselves are off limits to visitors in the tomb of the patriarchs. Uh, more proof of a period of time in Egypt when the Arabs and Muslims try to cover up as best they can. Uh, that the Bible is really true. <laughs> One more verse on this over in uh, Joshua uh, 24, 32. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they at Shechem, and the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. Back to Genesis, verse 50, verse 3. And 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so are uh, they fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. The biblical text seems to agree with the historians of the practice of embalming. It says that 40 days were fulfilled for him. For 40 days, we learn from Greek historians that the time of mourning was while the body remained with the embalmers which Herodias says, he was a famous uh, historian for that time frame, was 70 days. During that this time, the body lay in nitrate, the use of which was to dry up all its superfluous and noxious moisture. And when in the space of 30 days, this was sufficiently affected, the remaining 40, the time mentioned by Diodorus, uh, were employed in anointing it with gums and spices to preserve it. Which was properly, uh, which was properly the embalming. Uh, this this sufficiently explains the phraseology of this text. So you see here where it says, "And forty days were fulfilled for him, for so are they fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed." And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Three score is uh, score is twenty, so three score is sixty, plus ten is seventy. So for a total of seventy days to prepare the body. Quite a process. Okay, verse 4. And when the days of mourning were passed, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray ye, uh, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. Thou shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. <clears throat> And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, accordingly as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of the house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So soon here we see Pharaoh seems to, uh, to not have any objections or freely lets him go. As we mentioned before, it's a long journey to Hebron, some 200 miles. Basically, it's from here. In, uh, in Ramses, and you got to go all the way up to Hebron, which is over here. And they actually took a pause to mourn for seven days somewhere in here, which is kind of interesting. They say it's up near Jericho. And there's some some commentaries that actually say they took this route. They came straight across here and came up this side of the Dead Sea, crossed over Jericho, and then came back down to Hebron which is kind of weird uh, to do that. As we mentioned before, it's a long journey, about, about 200 miles. Uh, so some might think Joseph may not come back, but based on this fact that Pharaoh never mentioned concerning over returning and that Joseph and his brothers had it pretty good in Egypt. And Joseph was still very beloved due to his work on the famine. I don't believe the fact that the women and kids uh, do not Do not go. 
and the fact that the, some of Pharaoh's men went was that Joseph had become well loved by the Egyptians. Because I don't think they would have even agreed to bomb him if they were more like prisoners at this point. So I'm just pointing that out because we're going to get into a period of time where they become prisoners. Uh, not, not in Genesis, but we'll see this when we get to Exodus. Okay, moving on to verse 8 and 9. And the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they had left in the land of Goshen. And they went up with him, both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. So, so like I said, it'd be a journey about 200 miles. Uh, and they're leading their livestock and their children uh, back in uh, Goshen. Uh, it would say to me, Joseph trusted the Egyptians with their children. It would be uh, better, faster, and safer to travel without them. Uh, some might say Pharaoh insisted on this to make sure they returned, but I see nothing in the Bible that would say so. Uh, at this period, I like what we have seen, what we will see in Exodus. The Pharaoh and the Egyptian people loved the family of Jacob, uh, what they all did. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to chapter, I mean, verse 10 and 11. And they came to the, this is the funny part. This is why I don't think they went straight to Hebron. And they came to the thrashing floor of Ated, which is beyond Jordan. And there, and there they mourned with great and very sore lamentations. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. Whenever they say beyond Jordan, they're talking about the Jordan River, which is right here. And there is a part of it that at least here and actually goes down uh, to here. So by saying beyond Jordan, they go actually crossing the Jordan. So why would they do that? And some would say that beyond Jordan actually means this side. But why even make that reference when it doesn't it look like you even have to go anywhere near the Jordan River to get to Hebron? So actually there is a... Uh, and they, then they talk about a thrashing floor. Uh, this place was situated, according to Jerome, another historian, between the Jordan and the, uh, and the city of Jericho. But that's over here. I'll pull this up a little bit. So there's Jericho and there's the Jordan River. And it says it's about two miles from uh, Jordan and about three miles from uh, Jericho. So it's right in between these two, in between these two places. Where uh, Beth Gila was afterwards built. <laughs> Procopius of Gaza states the same, another historian. As the Taz signifies thorns, the place might have been uh, remarkable for their production. Though all the versions except the Arabic are uh, considered it as a proper name. As Moses wrote or revised his history on the east side of Jordan, and the term beyond Jordan in his five books, which includes Genesis, means westward of the Jordan. But in other parts of scripture, it generally means eastward. So for some reason, now they, they say that the reason they may have come up this side of the Dead Sea, because it was quite a massive amount of people, is that there was more availability of fresh water on this side. Uh, the salt sea, the dead sea, is fed by tributaries over on this side. And I got another map here that kind of shows this. You can see here these tributaries coming down into the, and there's more of them with, with fresh water than there is if you come up this side. I know you see these here, but these may be dry. <laughs> but for some reason, uh, the, these two historians uh, recorded that they actually came up this way. And that they stopped here in between Jericho at a thrashing floor. And what I found fascinating about this, remember when we talked about Isaac, uh, when he took his son up uh, to sacrifice him on the Mount, uh, the Mount Moriah, which is in Jerusalem. And I, get, I wonder sometimes that this is, if maybe they actually went to Mount Moriah, and that's where they mourned for Joseph, for Jacob, seven days. Uh, in honor of the fact that uh, this is the uh, this is the sacred uh, ground, there's actually a thrashing floor near Mount Moriah uh, in Jerusalem. So just a speculation of me, uh, you know me, I like speculations. But uh, so they believe it was over here near Jericho. 
Well, actually, the, uh, what they said is three miles. Maybe I should have gotten a, a better map, map. I don't think this one has a skip. Maybe tomorrow I'll find out how far it is. From Jericho to Jerusalem to, to the Jordan, because it says two miles from Jericho and three miles from the Jordan. That could be really close to Jerusalem. I don't think it's that close, though. I think that uh, between Jerusalem and Jericho is more like about 10 or 15 miles. But fascinating, because remember we talked about all these correlations between Joseph and Jesus. And of course, Jesus, and then we had the whole thing with uh, uh, Isaac. Uh, well, actually, no, not Isaac. Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac uh, on Mount Moriah, which is in uh, Jerusalem, way before something to think about so thrashing for this place is situated again the corner jerome uh, between the jordan and the city of jericho two miles from the former three miles from the latter where beth gila was afterwards built and that and the uh, term that was used was uh, a tear dead uh, signifies thorns the place might have been remarkable for their production Throughout all the versions except the Arabic considered as a proper name. There seems to be so many Egyptians that uh, there that the Canaanites never bothered them as, as, oh, I, I read verse 11 first. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, uh, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians, wherefore the name of it was called Ram, which is beyond Jordan. But you definitely know there were, that at some point they were near the Jordan River. It's even written in the Bible uh, that they were uh, beyond the Jordan. There seems to be so many Egyptians that the Canaanites never really bothered them as, po as possible. If they knew that they were Hebrews, it may have been different. As we will see later in Exodus through Joshua, uh, Canaanites and uh, you know, Joshua ends up destroying most of the Canaanites during the time that they take over the land. Not yet, uh, still in the future. Okay, verse 12. And his sons did unto him accordingly as he commanded them. And his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machapath, which Abraham brought with a field of possession of the burying place of the Ephron, the Hittite, before Merami. So let me show you those. I, I, I know some of you have seen these pictures before. And... Uh, I didn't put them in any particular order. Uh, this, I believe, is uh, these here are above. When you're looking at these. This is actually they're not inside of it. They're actually below it. The actual cave is under this floor. They built a church on top of it, and the Muslims have pretty much control over it. So here's two of the graves, and they believe that these. Uh, I believe these are two. Uh, these might be Isaac and Rebecca. there is actually uh, uh who we're talking about here joseph i mean jacob let's see it actually says that in the bottom here so that's jacob actually he's below it like i said this is just uh, a covering over the area to know where he's buried underneath where people could come and pray and here's an old old picture of the city of hebron this area we're talking about is right in here I don't know how old it is, but we're probably talking somewhere probably in the 1800s. Uh, photography was just coming into, into use back in the 1800s. Here's another old picture of the same area in the inside. Now this one here is the tomb of Rebecca and Isaac. Maybe we can tell by the backdrop if that other picture was uh, them. Let's see the middle. Yeah, that's it. It's Rebecca and Isaac. Okay, I got that one right. Oh, here's a better map. I should have brought this one up. 
this is the way they think they went straight straight to Hebron. But again, it doesn't take into account the beyond Jordan part. At the top there, what you what you see that is it uh, uh, during the time of uh, Herod, he actually built a wall. Is the church now originally that when Herod built this wall, the church wasn't there yet. And so that, uh, that they, just to protect where the graves were. So the graves were in here. The cave was under here. And then the, uh, it was the uh, Byzantines that built the church above it. So, it's, so this is that church you saw the inside of right here. And that one there is Abraham. It's above where he's buried is Jacob again. And that's the stairwell that goes down uh, behind us, hit under these rugs where you can go downstairs and actually see the actual graves, but no one's allowed down there. It's another angle. And this is an actual synagogue. Uh, this one, this particular one is the women's synagogue where they can go and pray. So I believe that who you're seeing in the background there is probably one of the women, uh, either Sarah, probably Sarah, because the Muslims are really devout they only think about Abraham and Sarah. Uh, they don't think about the others as being part of their hereditary. And there's the outside looking up at those walls I was showing you. Get another angle. There it is over there. Another aerial view. And it's another angle view of uh, Rebecca and Isaacs. So there's our photos for today. Now to finish up here. Verse 14, and Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren and all that went with him uh, to bury his father after he had buried his father. Uh, so I want to I just spend a minute, a minute here and uh, I like some Chuck uh, Smith and, and I, I'll say I have to agree a little bit. Uh, I'm looking forward to my new body, not worried about uh, my old uh, direct, uh, and it seems the Egyptians, but also the Jews, are a bit hung up with their bo old bodies, are buried. Uh, something Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.1. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You see, Paul is kind of hinting at the fact that uh, sooner or later when we die, this body is just going to turn back into dirt. And so uh, don't get hung up uh, so much. Uh, on, the, on where, see what the, uh, I just finished reading what I'm hearing there. So it makes me think not about this old body, but the new one we will receive during the rapture. And that's over in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 2. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and the mortal shall have put on immortality, and shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So I, uh, I always thought those were great example of uh, looking forward to uh, Jesus when he rose from the dead, came back in his uh, uh, his resurrected body, the perfect body again. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, Chuck Smith likes to go on to say, where I'm buried or cremated doesn't really matter to me. Uh, uh, we are heading back to just dust of the earth. Because uh, actually, whether you're buried, you got to go back to dust. It just takes longer. If you cremate it, it's going to be a shorter period of time. That's the only difference, really. Uh, God is smart enough to find out where our DNA is and, and convert us into a new body. So, yes, of course, we mourn when we, lo we lose people. Uh, we do definitely miss our loved ones, but I don't see the significance of where we are buried. Uh, most Jews like to be buried where they think the Messiah will come through the Golden or Eastern Gate. I should have got a picture of that. I don't know if I got one real quick. I don't think I have one available right here. I think you probably know which one I'm, I'm going to take a second to get to it, I think.
been trying to work on uh, getting my uh, pictures a little bit better organized so I can find them quicker. Bit. Find the right one. Uh, where's the wall I'm looking for? Oh, there it is. I think. Yeah, there it is. So right here uh, is the Eastern Gate that they're talking about. So if you look at all these, these are all graves right here. Uh, all the Jews that are anticipating their Messiah coming think that uh, they want to be here when the Messiah comes through these gates. That's what their belief is. So that's over there. That's actually talked about in uh, Ezekiel 43, 1 through 5. After he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, and beheld the glory of the God of Israel came from that way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision to which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chabar and fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Well, this is actually talking about the Millennium Kingdom temple that we'll see when we get to the thousand year reign. But that's not necessarily what Jews believe at this point. They think that that's where the Messiah is going to come through. And that's the whole reason it's blocked off now is because uh, I think it was the Byzantines or some or the Muslims felt that they blocked it, that maybe uh, God could get through and, uh, and, and come back uh, to the temple. It's kind of a ridiculous kind of a comment. We're talking about the creator of the world. Uh, not be able to uh, get through a, a few bricks. <laughs> but also for a believer prior to the church age, buried near where his return, uh, he returns to the Mount of Olives. Now, I definitely don't, this picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. And if you go up there, there's actually a, a cemetery up there also. And this we see in Zechariah 14. Uh, I'll just read a few verses. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Israel to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residual of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought the day, in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in the mount uh, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and the half of the mount shall be moved towards the north and half of it towards the south. Now that happens in, Je in Revelation 19. Uh, and we'll get to that when we talk about that in our Jacob study. But basically this Mount, mount Moriah, Mount uh, Olives, it's going to split in half. So that's, and just jumping down to verse 9 of Zechariah. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord in his name, one. So that's what the, uh, that's currently what the Jewish nation is expecting is coming. See, when Jesus came, they got, this is what, this is where they got confused. They were looking at this prophecy and they were expecting a king then, not a suffering savior to die for our sins. So that's why they don't they don't necessarily believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah because he didn't come like a king. So they're still waiting for their king. And that's uh, that's where the confusion is because he is going to come, uh, but it'll be uh, after the uh, tribulation uh, and just before the uh, when he tests up his kingdom on earth. So where there is a huge bureau, there's a, so like I said, we're about where this picture was taken from is a huge cemetery. Uh, now I'll admit I would love to visit Israel. I'm still looking forward to that day uh, to see where the living version of our Lord walked and taught. 
Uh, now the connection to my living savior takes on all new meaning. If I ever get a chance to do that. But uh, so that was uh, what I was going to do for today. And we'll end with a prayer. Oh dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to look in your word. And Lord, we look forward so much to your soon return. But also, Lord, that uh, you know, if I if uh, the opportunity does come uh, for us to visit your uh, the Holy Land, uh, that would be a welcome trip, Lord. And we give you all the praise and thanks for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay. So we will talk again tomorrow and finish up Genesis and see uh, see a little bit more about uh, the uh, the beginning of the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. So we'll talk to you all later. Have a great day.